it's great to have you on and a little bit more on your background because it started on the other side of the table, right? As an investor, which, you know, sometimes yeah. people start as a founder and they become an investor, like in my case. Uh, and then in other cases, you see people that started you know, as the investor and then jumped over to the founder. Uh, what made you want to become a founder after you did the years of investing? Amazing. I think um, I recommend people first operating and then investing. So I think you are right. I was wrong back then, but um, just a quick background. I did private equity here in Brazil and growth for almost a decade. I looked at multiple sectors, uh, mostly healthcare, uh, which is why I ended up founding uh, a, a company in the healthcare space here in Brazil. But I also, I always kind of like admire entrepreneurs a lot. So I think after maybe five years, I was like, kind of like, I, I went into meetings and I was like, I want to be the people on the other side of the table. Um, and I kind of like, I voiced that to a former boss and she was like, I had the same feeling when I was an investment banker I, and I moved to investing. So I think you should pursue, uh, and try to go to the other side of the table to see if that's what you want to do. So in 2018, I was looking at a thesis, uh, in the healthcare space, uh, that was basically healthcare payments. And we did find a company here in Brazil. And then I was like, I think that's it. I want to start a healthcare payments business in Brazil. Um, so I left and basically I, I stayed at there for a year with Thiago, which is one of my co-founders. The company didn't go right. Um, and it was super kind of like investment driven in the sense that we started the company. Like we had this investment thesis, everything made sense on the PowerPoint. We arrived there and then the problems all looked different on the ground. So basically like the problems didn't connect with the solution and the thesis that we had. Uh, but I kind of like, I love the experience that I wanted to to dive uh, further. So I decided to continue to try to open up, up, open up a company. So in 2019, I was like, I'm decided to do something in healthcare. Healthcare is a space that's going to change a lot. FinTech has been changing a lot over the past few years in Brazil. Um, so that's when we started people and actually became a broker. So Going to your question, I think being an investor really helped me with the mental map and the frameworks and the way I think about the business, kind of like what's driving revenue, what's driving cost. But I think it didn't prepare me a lot of the, to the operational challenges and how you actually manage a company day to day, how you align people, how you align big groups of people, because usually investing you are like in a small team. Uh, so I think it had good things and bad things. And now four years as an entrepreneur, uh, I wish I knew a lot of the things I know now uh, back then. They would probably make you a much better investor, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, you definitely get a perspective. You can talk, you can talk to those founders that, you know, or those investors that have been in that founder seat before and not, a lo not just the empathy of the, the craziness of building a company, but there's just some unique insights you have when you go and you just kind of get your butt kicked in that world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. So some things look so simple in PowerPoint. And then when you are an investor, you kind of like you buy to that. You, you kind of like you believe. You say like, oh, there's this funnel. The funnel works that way. After you started your own company, you're like, it's not so easy. That's going to be super challenging. So I think it really, really uh, builds a knowledge that it's, you have to be an entrepreneur to know after uh, to, to invest properly. Like that's my view. What are some of those things that you realized when you had to like kind of put your feet on the street and go out and talk to customers. And maybe you feel like you were naive about as an investor. And, you know, what was the wake up call that you experienced? And maybe share some of those anecdotes of things that maybe you in your mind were perfect. And then you got to the reality and you're like, wow, this is not exactly how I envisioned it. Okay. So I'm going to tell everyone about the first company I started, which was called Seals. So uh, the, the name was bad, but that's another story. But um, we wanted to solve basically a fraud problem in the healthcare space. So like in healthcare, a lot of the, like it's getting more expensive year over year. Uh, a huge part of that is explained by fraud and people uh, basically misusing their healthcare. So I wanted to get that data and I wanted to look for trends. So, oh, if that person has three doctors in a month, probably that person is is committing a fraud somehow. And if I can identify that, maybe I can take it out of the expenditure and then the price adjustments will be lower. 
So the thesis was kind of like brilliant because 40% of the healthcare cost was estimated to be fraud. Uh, there was a huge lever for you to reduce the cost and et cetera. But when I arrived there the first day, I literally went to a fraud department within a healthcare plan. Everyone there had papers. They were literally correcting papers and they were like, oh, this is a fraud. This is not a fraud. And kind of like uh, writing things on, on paper. And there was kind of like no digitalized data. So there was there were no infrastructure. Uh, there was no regulation. So no regulation that obliged people to behave a certain way or to digitalize data or to have kind of like certain codes or even regulation that would allow you to identify the fraud and charge back. So there was no charge back. So from a very macro perspective, from an investor seat, it made a lot of sense. When I arrived there, it went, everything was paper, so there was no digital data. Uh, the HMOs that were, were going to be my customers, they didn't want to hire a solution. They thought that was super strategic, so they wanted to do in-house. There was no regulation allowing chargebacks. Uh, so basically, it was impossible to build what I was calling when I started uh, CEOs back then, uh, the kind of like the processing infrastructure of the healthcare world. So I think that was kind of like um, the investor in me trying to create a company. And I learned so much there because literally you have to go there. You have to try a lot. You have to do prototypes. You have to see uh, the amount of clients that you're going to have in, in a given solution um, before you venture uh, because things look very, very easy on paper. It's very hard in, in practice. How do you look at Brazil in the healthcare space compared to like the U.S. market? If you're talking to an investor... And the investor is more familiar with like the U.S. market and the dynamics of the U.S. market. What is it about Brazil that makes it unique from a positive and a negative perspective? Like where are the where are the opportunities that maybe don't exist in other markets people are surprised about? And what are the complications that may uh, be unique to Brazil? I think there are, there are a lot of parallels between Brazil and the U.S. So it is a corporate uh, sponsored market in the sense that most people have access to private health care through their employers. Um, it is, there is like a medical inflation problem that's very big and that corporations are trying to change that. Uh, most solutions are B2B, like in the US. I would say that, um, so when you try to explain uh, what exists in Brazil, I wouldn't say it's so different on the private side. I think the public side is very different. Um, and then the other thing that I think it's, it's a big difference between the two is Brazil is much simpler than the U.S. Like, like the U.S. has a lot of point solutions. So you have like patient care navigation, you have brokers, you have healthcare plans, you have providers, you have provider network, you have uh, kind of like solutions that are looking at diabetes and then others looking at chronics and others looking at muscular diseases. So, so it's, it's very, very specific. Like in Brazil, you didn't have that um, depth. So literally a few stakeholders started to incur more responsibility. So like um, the plans, they also have networks that they rent out. Uh, the brokers, they do a lot of things from selling to managing and even claim processing and reviewing. So I think in that sense, uh, it's a little bit simpler uh, for them to understand. And because it's simpler and because those players have large responsibilities, they also have a lot of things under their, their belts and a lot of inefficiencies. So. I think it creates a very latent opportunity for us to start companies in Brazil um, in comparison to the U.S. Do you think that simplicity is a, a feature uh, rather than a bug? Because you, know, you can take both arguments. One would be complexity is good because when you have complexity, it gives you an opportunity to solve big problems. But in this case, you're saying that it's a, a little bit more simple, which maybe means that there's less players. And so a company might be doing more which then gives you an angle to get in and kind of solve a specific problem because it's less verticalized exactly. like in the US. How do you frame it for someone uneducated about the sector? Yeah. So I think that's the the latter that I just mentioned. And one thing that's very interesting, they are doing a lot of things in terms of scope and a lot of things in terms of like the persona or the type of company they are trying to reach. So like in my case, uh, my competitors, which are traditional healthcare brokers, they are basically serving customers that have three employees to 300,000 employees uh, with a single solution. They have zero technology and basically they are services business. So trying to create a parallel between a bank and a broker, 
like the large customers, they will get personality. The smaller customers will get Itaú. And what I'm trying to disrupt is Itaú. So leveraging technology to deliver a very solid experience to, lo- to smaller players that won't get the service uh, layer that larger companies will do. And by doing that, I basically create or enable two, two main outcomes. So um, efficiency in their HR, finance, finance department, and, and whatsoever. And then the second is cost control and cost reduction over time. Um, so I think like that's how I try to, to frame the problem and what I'm trying to build here in Brazil. Why do you think in Latin America, you know, more broadly, there's just less specialization? Like I go back to the real estate market and I'm like, I remember our customers at Viveral, we had customers, same customer, sold commercial real estate, rented commercial real estate, sold residential, rented residential, you know, and did the high end and the low end market, you know, like, like, and, you know, that's just obviously one anecdote. But if, if I look at, you know, Latin America and Brazil more specifically, it seems like the incumbents play a broader role rather than like this more verticalized solution. Uh, does that mean that there's just more opportunities because, and is it a maturity situation or like, what, what, what would you say? And, you know, maybe, maybe give your perspective on healthcare, but just broader as an investor, since you've sat in the investor chair and you've probably seen companies that, you know, are building in different sectors, whether that be education, you know, financial services. I know you did some investing in both of those sectors. Do you see that same yeah. trend across the board in Brazil? Uh, I do. And my hypothesis, like as an entrepreneur and, and, and former investor, is, is that relationship plays a larger role here in Brazil. So like and what I mean by relationship is like brands, brand recognition, or maybe the relationship you have there. So like, oh, I really uh, like that Itaú is like a huge brand. brand. I trust Itaú a lot. So Itaú is going to be a one-stop shop for all, type of customer, all types of customers. And then when you leverage technology to actually provide some real value, so like Nubank, they created value for a population that paid a huge amount of money to have a bank account. So like technology actually served them, you know, served those customers in a way that broke um, kind of like the relationship and the, the brand angle that you actually have here in the region. And I always try to pitch that like a lot of people ask, like brokerage is a super uh, relation in, relationship intensive business in the sense that, you know, you're a broker, you have dinner with a broker, like how are you going to replace that figure? And I'm like, the only way you replace relationship is with actually a crispier value prop with product. So that's where I try to build, but it takes a little bit of time. So uh, I remember when I was like pitching to an inter- international investor and she said like, oh, so there is this thesis in Brazil that software penetration is low. So software penetration is going to go up. Like if you try to sell software for someone that never used software before, it's extremely hard. Like uh, even though it make, makes a lot of sense from a very macro perspective, it's very hard to execute on that thesis. Uh, so I think uh, one of the things that I try to, to uh, resonate with the investors is like, yes, that's true, but it takes time for people to, actu- to actually perceive that value. So rather than exponential from the, from the get-go, I think growth in a lot of sectors will be consistency, consistency, consistency. A lot of people happy, you get a referral, you get, you get that mo- movement in, and then you get exponential. So I do feel that in a lot of sectors, that it's going to be a little bit different from the U.S., in which people are already very uh, used to, where, to kind of like using software and to trying to get the best solutions for their needs and very efficient when it comes to labor, which is not the case here in Brazil. So uh, I think those kind of like differences uh, explain the, the phenomenon. You mentioned the word trust, which I think is a really important recurring theme in Latin America because there's less trust in institutions, there's less trust in government, there's less trust in you know, different, different areas. How do you go yep. about building trust if you're a startup? Like you're competing in healthcare, right? Like this is a, yeah. it's an important thing, right? Like if you were to make a short list of like what's important in people's lives, healthcare would be up there, right? <laughs> like what approaches have you done in order to build trust uh, you know, for your customers and build a brand, especially when you're approaching and there's incumbents that exist. Exactly. I think we have been over-investing a lot when it comes to brand, uh, kind of like community building, which is something very important for us as well because we sell to HRs and they are very community-oriented in the sense of how they 
buy and consider solutions for their own companies. Uh, we have been trying to be very intentional regarding content. And as a brand, we always try to position ourselves as healthcare, even though it's super important, it's super expensive, it not, it's not super strategic within companies. So it's a little bit on the boring side as a theme, like, oh, my, my plan is expensive. I have a lot of problems. So how can we educate the market and change that? Uh, so we have been kind of like trying to, to position ourselves as an educator, uh, trying to change uh, how people approach the healthcare problem that they have within their companies. But I don't think there is a silver bullet there. And I think, again, consistency and executing on consistently for a long time, I think that's gonna, what's going to kind of like change. Uh, and then you become a trusted brand. And I think a lot of startups and technology companies have managed to, to get there. Um, but when you look at the time horizon, they have been around for 10 years. They have been around for, for 80 years. And I think the, the momentum that we lived in the past four or five years as tech founders and, and as entrepreneurs, we kind of like forgot that it takes time for you to build a company. So everyone was super anxious that everyone wanted to build a unicorn within three years. And it's like most companies, they're going to take 10, 15, 20 years to be really, really large uh, in a market like, like Latin America. And I think uh, this, this moment, I think people are trying to real, are realizing that again. And they're like, oh, I have to be consistent and sustainable for a long period of time. And then I'm going to achieve amazing results. You mentioned, I, I totally agree. You mentioned that the kind of, you look at the market, there's customers that serve the 300,000, the huge range. How did you define your ICP in the, from the beginning, your, you know, your, your ideal customer profile? What was the process for that? Um, how important was it to kind of hone in on that early? And, and have you since expanded the scope of who you serve? At what point do you do that when you're a founder? We've been thinking about at Latitude, we built some products. Do we serve the pre-seed seed founders? Do we try to build a product to serve the, the later stage companies? And it's, it, it's a debate of like, how do you enter the market? What's your go-to-market? And then what's your kind of market expansion strategy. How have you thought about that at, at your company? So when we started People, it was very convic conviction-led in the beginning, like how we define our ICP. So we interviewed a bunch of HRs, a bunch of customers, and then we kind of like, we saw this pattern uh, that people that had around 400, 200, 800 employees, they were very underserved. So we saw they were unhappy with their current broker. They didn't have any kind of like uh, more differentiated value prop. Um, and they were willing to change, but th their feeling was, we don't see anyone in the market that actually has a good solution that's worth my time to kind of like go through this changing process. So in the beginning, it was kind of like totally founder-led. We had some interviews. That's what we believe. Let's build a product for those. And then I think based on actually having our product in the street, we have been refining. Uh, or ICP, and and I think that's one of the big learnings I've had I've had as a founder, which is theory, especially product theory. When you're building a product, it's very good, but a lot of the things you learn by actually delivering your product and putting it out there. Uh, just try not to spend two years building a product before putting it out there, but just put something out there and just just test test it out and learn from it, rather than just kind of like reading a super deep product book that's talking to Silicon Valley companies that are very mature and basically it's not relatable for us for a startup that doesn't have a product at that stage. So, and then we have been refining. So we have kind of like currently our ideal customer profile goes from like 100 employees to 5,000. We have seen that the comp we have been going larger a little bit on the, because we see like the shared pains and we look at the pain. So like are those pain points common across those, those different clients and those different client segments? And now we have been kind of like letting clients go on the smaller side. And as a founder, I think it took me a long time to let clients go because you don't want to let revenue go. We don't want to let clients go. And I think it really diminished the ability for us to move faster on the clients that made sense. So that's something I'll, I'll also look back and I'm like, oh, that's, that's something I would really change if I could go back in time. Uh, just kind of like firing some customers that are not ideal to you. 
Um, but now we are trying to get better at this. Yeah, it's a hard one, right? Because, you know, yeah. maybe they were also early customers and maybe you have a relationship with them or, and also like as a founder, you don't want to give, you don't want any revenue to leave, right? <laughs> like, but yeah. you know, oftentimes you have to kind of bite the bullet and think about what the long-term business is going to look like. And you got to kind of take one step back in order to take two steps forward sometimes. Yeah. And I think focus is much easier said than done. Like 100%. when you look at the amount of people, <laughs> a lot of people just kind of like looking at everything. And then you see like 20% of my company is looking at this client segment that I don't want to continue with. Then you kind of like have to just make the right decision. So how did you, how did you internalize and mobilize? I guess first you have to have the conviction yourself. Uh, if you're not fully bought into the idea, you know, as the leader of the organization, people are kind of going to continue serving those customers that maybe aren't at the core. Was there a like an internal dialogue that you had with the company at one point where you're like, look it, we've been serving these types of customers. We have to like tighten it up. And, you know, how did you mobilize your resources? Because if you've been doing something for a while, it's really hard to just change. Yeah, I think being super honest and vulnerable here, I think what really changed me was the, the new market momentum. So looking at profitability and looking at sustainability on a per client segment basis. Because before, when everything was about growth, I was like, just sell to anyone that wants to buy our product. Like, it doesn't matter if the product's not suitable to them. And then they're going to open up 5,000 support uh, tickets. And then we'll need to figure out those support tickets. And then basically that's going to create a huge uh, inefficiency in the company. But then when everyone was pressure pressuring us in order to gain efficiency, uh, then the decision of the ICP, the product fit, and, and all the metrics, it made a lot of sense. So I think the wake-up call was not internal. It was external. Like, And then that made me change as a founder. No, that's great. I mean, it's one of the, I would say, outcomes, positive outcomes for this cycle is that we're getting more fit as, as founders, right? And, yeah. you know using the health analogy, it's healthy, right? Like it's, it's actually healthy for businesses. And so I think that, yeah. that listening to that and internalizing it uh, is, is something that probably you're going to be happy that you did that over the last, you know, 12 months because you're setting up the, uh, for a better foundation to build on, right? Yeah. I think like this, this whole process kind of like to the, to the whole founder community, right? Of us having less access to capital, us having a higher bar in terms of metrics and things we have to achieve. It's super um, important in the sense that as a society, we always kind of like we were, we have to be happy. We have to grow like, you know, all, all the bad sides. They were kind of like, people were like, oh, you know, um, your employees, they have to be happy all the time. You have to be growing all the time. But, but to be honest, like life is about like you growing up as an adult. It's very painful. And, and that's very important to your process of like growing up. And the same is true uh, to companies. So I think one of the reality checks I had, I had to do as a CEO in, like, in terms of culture was like, guys, I made a mistake. I told you that we were going to need to, like, we were going to be happy and like healthy and benefits were going to be amazing. Now we have to deliver and we are going to grow like slowly within our size. Like we are not going to kind of like overshoot in that sense. So I think that reality check in many, many aspects was very positive for, for, for like company beauty. Did you feel like it was a cultural shift at that point where, because I, I remember at, at Viva at one point, we did the whole like ping pong table slash fresh fruit and like all the things that you naively think are culture when you're starting a company yeah. and you, you see that and you see it in San Francisco when you go there and there's a chef at, at the office and. I remember having a conversation with Nico Sakazi from, from Kazakh and he's like, you know what people like? People like winning. <laughs> like if the company yeah. feels like you're winning, the culture is, it's, it's 90% of the culture because people want to be a part of a winning team. And so yeah. I, I think that that, you know, really reshaped my thinking about culture and we had to kind of make some adjustments. H how do you feel like that transition as a founder? Do you feel like worried about like, like, how do you go through the process of taking away a benefit? You know, like we recently, we have a remote team and we kind of revisited the like the WeWork benefit and other, you know, other like office 
things. And, and we were like, listen, it's not the, the time right now to give a stipend for people to invest in their home office um, just because yep. that's like just cash that we maybe need. How do you think about that and how receptive was the team and how did you deliver the message? Yeah, I think that was one of the other things that I kind of like learned as a founder because in the beginning you hire people and then you kind of like get attached to those people and they're like, they're amazing. I really trust them. And then you are very afraid to make changes because you might you think that those people will dislike it and might leave the company and they leave the company. You are basically, oh, my company is going to be over, right? And one of the realizations you have is just you have to do the right things. People are going to leave. People that you thought that they will never leave and the company survives. And a lot of times, actually, the company is stronger after those people leave because they signed up for a job in a culture or with expectations that don't exist anymore. So I think it was kind of like uh, very, very important for me to realize those things. And really, I really try to focus as a CEO. I think my job, a lot of my job is like aligning expectations. I feel that if people have the right expectations aligned, they will be happy because then they will have reality to kind of like uh, compare their, their selves, like themselves to. So um, that's what I have been trying to do. And, and I couldn't agree more with the sentence like, when I started the company, I thought people wanted autonomy. And I was very afraid to say, like, I'm, I'm not going to say something that I really think because I'm going to kind of like hurt their autonomy. Like, in the end, people want success. And like, of course, you have to give them autonomy to kind of like figure out solutions. Like, there are a lot of people that you hire are like a hundred times better than you. But at the same time, you have to give them direction and you have to make the team win. And that's going to make everyone super kind of like hyped. Uh, because autonomy on a standalone basis, like people will just end up leaving and go elsewhere because like, that's not going to hold people to their, in, in their jobs. So I think that there were also kind of like important realizations that I had, uh, in the past four years. Yeah. I think that the different phases of the business too, the pendulum kind of swings a little bit. Like I feel like, you know, in the beginning, it's really important to be just much more kind of hands-on, give direction. The company grows a little bit and then you give a little bit more space because you bring in people that have expertise and everyone's kind of a generalist at the very beginning, the kind of pre-product market fit phase. And you're just all like, you know, talking to the customer, obsessing about what the solution is and, and adjusting really fast. So I, I do think there's different kind of moments for, for different things. But I did realize that, uh, you know, I remember this whole like evaluating different strategies for culture and, you know, management and I think it, I can't remember, uh, holacracy was one that was from the Zappos hat, which is a crazy like concept. And I realized like people, like there was someone in my company that was like really pushing for that. And I was like, people don't want like just complete flexibility to decide anything. People actually enjoy direction. It's finding the right balance and strategy, particularly for the stage of the business also. So it sounds like yeah. you're navigating that and you realize that, you know, that direction is, is important. Um, I want to I want to double click a little bit more on uh, maybe some advice that you can share for other startup founders, you know, wanting to go through the same you know journey that you've been on. You know, you've raised some capital, you're executing, your the business is growing. What are some necessary skills you think for early stage founders from let's say from the fundraising perspective, since you had that perspective as an investor? What takeaways do you have that you applied? To your fundraising process because you have great investors involved yeah i think like i i, I talked to a lot of founders about about fundraising and i think the common mistake that i see is people don't actually look at fundraising as kind of like a strategy so what's my strategy here like who do i want to talk to how much do i want to raise uh like i don't want to negotiate against myself so i don't want to price this round before other people are pricing it to me and i think a lot of founders are very passionate about purpose. And when they pitch to investors, they think they want to, they, they have to pitch this, right? They have to pitch they're going to change the world. Like, and to be honest, like investors are very financial driven animals and they want to grasp the size of your opportunity, how you're going to make money, why you are the right, why you are the right player to win, why now, uh, where, where you are, where you're going. Like, and I just think when you are kind of like drafting that message and that strategy, you have to remind yourself, who are you communicating to? Like, you're not trying to make uh, like a bunch of analysts very motivated about working at your company. You want to try 
to make a lot of people that are very structured and very financial driven invest in your company and you have to draft your message to that. And I think just dub double clicking on that, especially when I talk to healthcare, healthcare founders, they really want to show their care part. So like I have a, I ha we, I, we have doctors at the people, we have nurses at people, we have a care team and care is super essential to what we do and how we differentiate ourselves uh, in comparison to other brokers that exist. Having said that, if I just keep pitching that to investors, they were like, how is that going to win the game? And like, why is care so important? So when I'm in like fundraising mode, it's like huge opportunity, huge problem. That's why being a broker is the right thing to do. Uh, my go-to market or the angle I'm approaching this problem, it's super uh, smart because of X, Y, Z. That's what I have achieved. So you, you just turn on a different part of your brain. And I think a lot of founders don't realize that. And they just pitch to investors in a way that really like it's going to be super hard for them to relate to your pain. So I was a mentor. I've been kind of like an, an informal mentor to a lot of doctors that want to start kind of like healthcare companies. And doctors, I think, are a very good example to that because it's just kind of like they, they start describing the disease and I'm just like, oh, my God, they, they just lost investor right there. Like, even though like this condition is super large and super like people won't think like this when they are ev evaluating a, a, a fundraising opportunity. So um, I think that would be my, my kind of like my top tip, especially for people uh, starting a company in the healthcare space. No, that, that makes sense. It's, it's, it's interesting. If you don't address those like size of the market, the problem, you know, all, and educate on that, you can have all the passion in the world, <laughs> like, but you're going to miss that passion, the purpose piece. It's just part for the course. Like if you don't have that, but if you just have that, there's an expression in Texas, they say you're, you're all hat and no cattle, <laughs> which, which I think is a great representation of, of that example. So Let's go a little bit deeper on the business itself. Talk a little bit more about kind of where you are in the business, where you want to go, and uh, you know maybe share a little more insight into 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 People Saudi. Amazing. So People Saudi is a healthcare uh, broker that basically leverages technology to drive uh, operational efficiency within companies and to reduce healthcare costs. Uh, we also have a care team uh, helping us that uh, helping us on that job. Uh, we started the company in 2019, so we have been around for four years now. We literally started with like zero clients, a PowerPoint, uh, and a license. We only had a license. We only had the broker license, uh, and it was like timing was very fortunate because when we started the business. There was no digitalization in the healthcare space, so carriers are not digitalized. Companies were very office-based. But then I think the pandemic kind of like helped us digitalize both sides. So as a broker, we are basically selling healthcare plans and healthcare products to companies, uh, which are the largest buyers and our target customer here in Brazil. So COVID really helped us in that sense. And we literally moved from zero to 70 clients within 12 months. Uh, a lot of clients were willing to change uh, the solution that they had because like that was not working in a world that the broker was not visit visiting them twice a, twice a week, which was basically how which is basically how traditional brokers operate. They are very in person. It's very BPO like. Um, and then from there we have been growing, uh, both on the efficiency and both on the care and cost reduction size side. Uh, we have 250 clients now. We serve over uh, 100,000 healthcare lives. Um, we continue to compete with the largest brokers and the largest incumbents, a lot of the M MNC, so Ayan, Mercer, Willis, kind of like we compete with those as well, uh, and a few of the traditional Brazilian players. And we are currently like one of the probably top 20, top 25 uh, largest brokers in the country. It has been a journey. Like we've learned a lot through all the process, but um, at the same time, I think now we are like a business, right? So we have a, a, a revenue uh, size that it's kind of like, oh, we're sizable. We are audited. We have 200 people working at people. We, we, so it's, it's very, has been very rewarding to see that journey. But at the same time, like we have 100,000 lives under management in a market, addressable market is like th uh, 30 million people. So it's only kind of like we're only starting at the same time. So I think that kind of like 
looking back and seeing a business, but looking forward and seeing a lot of opportunities, it's very rewarding for me uh, to be uh, as a founder. So you brought some amazing investors on board, right? Like some of the, you know, the best investors in the region. You got Kaze, you got Monashis, you got Thrive, you got 1VC, you got Atlantico, you got all these great investors on board. How have you structured your board at this stage? And, and how do you interact with your board? Do you have a board set up? Talk about uh, the size of the board, who's on the board. And then let's talk a little bit more about running efficient board meetings. I think it's a topic that founders at your stage don't have great insight into how to be efficient with the board. Love to hear your lessons in, in how you've structured that and what's worked and what hasn't worked. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. So like all my advice is kind of like a still work in progress, but uh, just giving some details. Thrive led our Series A, which was uh, closed in the end of 2021. So they are the only investor that actually has a formal board sheet. Um, and I think that's one of the the things that I really try to to give this advice to to other founders is don't overcomplicate your, your board early on. So like if you're raising like early like early stage rounds, like just don't go into that complexity. Uh, try to keep it very simple. Um, the, the the board is also very small, so we have three board uh, seats. Uh, one is actually held by Thrive, and two are uh, held by the founders. Um, we have board in, board meetings every quarter. Um, I've been I've been doing hybrid, so I've been doing in person and also uh, remote board meetings. I think in person are kind of like five hundred times better. So I think so just kind of like the 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 atmosphere of having everyone in the room actually looking at the data and being engaged in the discussion makes a lot of difference. Uh, I think that has been a learning. And then the second thing I've been trying to do as a founder in order to make it more efficient, efficient it is I always thought that the board meeting was really heavy on kind of like status reporting. So me telling the board what's happening for two hours and like zero discussion around that. So what I do is I send a deck to all the board, um, to, the, the, to the board uh, participant, but also to the observers. So Kazakh and Monashis participate in, in Atlético as observers. Uh, so what I see, I send them the deck and I send them a podcast that I, that I record going through uh, the business update. So they can kind of like listen to me when they are running or when they are working. And basically I just kind of like go through what's the, like a business review and then if needed, they schedule sessions before the board and then they send questions ahead. And then we do the Q&A live uh, to, start, to kick off the board meeting. So I think that kind of like was a, a hack that I tried to, to do with the board that has been helping a lot. Um, uh, is that working think, well? Is that working well? It's, it's interesting because it's more reminiscent of a public, public board, right? Where you have like the earnings call and then you, you have the analysts that ask questions, which is very cool because... First of all, your realization is the exact same realization I had. The first couple of board meetings, I remember, you know, Kazek and Monashis were both on my board, so we share them. And I remember the first couple of board meetings, I was like nervous and I'm like making sure that I'm like trying to pitch them on the business still. And then I was like, Brian, they're already investors. Why are you, you don't need to sell them on it. You need to, you know, and so, so giving that information prior to and making it less about a reporting structure. I think it's one of the most common mistakes that Series A founders make when they first starting having a structure formal board, but how have people been receptive? Do they actually listen to the podcast? Uh, are they, do they come with questions? How is that working? It, it's a mix. It's a mixed kind of like uh, feedback. So half of the people that I send the podcast to, they're kind of like, I love it. I'm running, I'm listening. Like I don't even go through the deck. Half of the people like, oh, this is kind of like you're going, you're reading the deck. Like I'm going to just read the deck and then I'm going to send you questions. But all of them send us questions because we send those kind of like this business update sometimes like 10 days before. Uh, so kind of like this trying to break the, the, the reporting and the kind of like the board discussion, I think that has been very helpful. Um, I think as a second kind of like thing we've, I've learned uh, as a founder is sometimes uh, you want to kind of like make important decisions at the board level or you're talking about fundraising like now with the market. like. When should I fundraise? I think it's pro probably that's kind of like a top question in everyone's mind. Like, what milestones do I need to have? And if you have multiple people in the room, especially when they are competitors among themselves, 
I just think those alignments are not, you should, you should be doing them in pre-board meetings. So just have like a late, a long lunch with one of your investors and just be very honest with them and then just go to the other and to the other. Like if everyone is in the same room, two of the following will happen. Either people will converge to the same place, kind of like heard the fact, or two, everyone will be kind of like smoke and mirrors. No one will commit. So like for you as a founder, it's like both scenarios are horrible. So just if you want to make, to, to make very important decisions to the company and you think that uh, dynamic might play out, just try to do pre-board meetings and, and get those important decisions before you enter the board. I think it's very smart. You'll get much more candid conversations. One-on-one -on -one is more effective. It's a good investment you know, for, for your relationship with the, with the board members also. Obviously, you don't want to like kill too much time there, but if it's once a quarter and you do a check-in and then you cover these individual topics, I also find that being at a board meeting and like flushing out and discussing lots of things that you could, you can be more effective on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then you'll kill a lot of time at a board meeting if there's like tons of, you know, tons of debates about different things. And I like to kind of narrow the focus of the board meeting to like one or two really salient topics. Um, and I think that sounds like you're, you're, you're doing a lot of the things that I learned that I didn't do initially. And it sounds like you're ahead of the game uh, with, compared to most founders that find these things out by, you know, by making mistakes and realizing what, what works I, and what doesn't work. I, I made a lot. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like my first board meetings were like status report, like reporting a lot, like a, a lot of bad things happened before I, I, go, I got here. Um, and, and I think like an, another thing I would say, like if you are a founder and you're doing monthly board meetings, just stop. Like monthly board meetings are such a waste of time. Like, and I see a lot of people doing it. Like, that's how I started. Not, not a board meeting per se, but like an investor meeting, like the beginning when, when they didn't have a board. And like, you don't have anything so freaking frequent that you want to discuss with your board every month. Like, you, at least not if you're like in, in your business, like you're running the business in a normal cycle where product's going to take time to build. Like, results are going to be a little bit long for you to see. Uh, and then you're going to have like inputs for a an, an educated discussion. But having said that, uh, I have like a, something that I discussed in the board, like right at the beginning of people that, that I, I'll never forget, like how a good discussion brought to a board meeting can help you change your business. So in the beginning, uh, basically our business motto is we get a recurring, recurring um, commission for managing the benefits. And then we usually get an upfront uh, commission for selling a new contract. Very similar to kind of like the real estate market. And then in the beginning, we would give that upfront commission back to our clients in something we would call, we call it health back, right? So that was the name. And the, 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 the idea was we give it health back to them. They will only be able to capture this money if they renew with us or if they purchase other benefits that we are selling. But like for many reasons that didn't work out, like you were trying to differentiate yourself based on price solely, like that was bad. The incentives you were get, giving to your own clients were super bad because they wanted to change like the, the healthcare plan that they have every year. And that was super bad for the long run. And I remember bringing this discussion to the board and Erna from Kazakh, he, said, he, he was there. And then he was like, Manuela, you design the incentives you want to give to people right now. The, the, the incentive you are designing, it's not good for your business. And you should think, you should think through. And then I remember kind of like, and after the board, board meeting, I ended up uh, health back. So I think that's kind of like um, how board can really make you think out. But sometimes you are, you are too kind of like uh, into a problem and you cannot see, look from it from, from the outside. And I think that's exactly what a good board meeting should be making you do as a father. Yeah, and it's ideally someone that's been in the trenches like Hernan that, you know, uh, has you know seen seen things and been there and you know a lot of the the best board members either they've operated or they've just got so good at pattern recognition because they're seen so many different uh, situations. Exactly. And, and I want to I want to uh, quote Charlie Munger here on incentives because you know he says show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome and so, it's so, so, so important to align incentives properly. You know that's and it's yeah. one of the hardest things to do whether that's for sales teams and whatever, or partners or affiliates, 
Like those, those things are, they really matter. Wise words from Charlie Munger. I agree. So what's next for you as a founder? You know, what are your current goals? What, what are you doing to, to, to make that happen? I think like, um, I see myself, I see people as a long-term journey. So I do see myself kind of like trying to drive this mentality of consistency and execution over the long term, especially in a B2B business. Uh, and I see myself doing it for the next 20 years or so. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I don't see myself doing anything else ap apart from like starting a company. So if things would change, like, I don't know, if like people would be sold or like if, if the business uh, would end for some reason or, or if, if, if I'm not suitable for the CEO role anymore, uh, I think I would probably uh, go elsewhere and try to start a company in another sector, tackling another big problem. Uh, but in the long, long, long term, I would love to work with education, which is something that makes me very passionate. Uh, so probably after people, hopefully 20 years from now, I think that's where I'll spend my time. Well, it sounds like you got the entrepreneur bug. And, you know, the reality is we <laughs> both know being an investor is easier than being an entrepreneur. Yeah. But true. apparently you, you don't like better. the easy route. Uh, I don't like the easy route. No, no. <laughs> I, I do love building the company in like a culture. Like I'm super passionate about it. Um, and I think probably one of my superpowers as a founder, it's kind of like my emotional stability throughout the journey. Because for some people, it's just, it's very intense and it, it, it has a large toll on many, like your marriage, your kids. Um, but I think I have been able to balance those uh, in a way that I look at myself and I'm like, yeah, I think this is, this is sustainable for the long term. Uh, I hope so. That's great because that's one of the hardest battles as an entrepreneur, right? Uh, managing your psyche. I know you talk a lot about fostering emotional intelligence and diversity in the startup world. Uh, maybe you can end yep. us, bring us home with you know some more thoughts about how you think about those topics throughout your career and how you foster the, those at, at, at people. Yeah, so I, I like myself, I, I do feel that um, working in a startup, I believe a lot of the sentence, which is happiness equals uh, reality minus expectations. And the way that every founder should kind of like align their happiness is keeping expectations balanced and on the lower side if possible. Uh, just suffer uh, for the things you can you can control, like things you cannot control. You kind of like it's a learning and then it just move. I know it's easier uh, said than done, but I do feel that if you don't create this mindset, it's going to be very, very hard for you to kind of like be a successful uh, founder, like successful in the sense that you are going to be able to do this for a long time because it's really, really, really intense. Um, and it's a roller coaster, even though it's like uh, someone, is, everyone is telling you that that's the reality. And, and regarding diversity and inclusion, like I always um, think that as a founder, you were trying to innovate. So you're trying to solve the problem from a perspective that no one else did. And you believe for some reason that you are the chosen one to do so, right? Because all founders do, right? They truly believe that them and their companies, that they're going to be the ones that solve their pain point. And if you think about innovation, innovation is actually doing something different for the first time. And then if you want to innovate, I think people should embrace diversity uh, in a much more intentional way because diversity is bringing different people to the table and your chances of like drawing something different, drawing an innovative solution with different people around the table is much, much larger. So I think if you can connect those two, kind of like your success, the success of your company, diversity, like having a different team, also the mental stability, all the things associated to that, I think that's a, a winning uh, recipe for, for starting a business. Well, thank you for sharing your perspective. I think that you've got the long-term recipe uh, you know, top of mind. And, and I think those are key to, you know, building a successful, you know, organization that, that lasts, right. Which is kind of the, all, all the, the, the goals here as we, as we build companies. So thanks for sharing your, your insight with us. And it's great to catch up with you and congrats on everything you've built thus far and excited to see where you take it. Thank you, Brian. It was lovely being here. Thanks for, for inviting me. Thank you.